smoke count the stars ablaze only one could breathe life into clay only one can quiet raging seas only one has power to redeem if y'all want to pray all the praise goes to Jesus all the praise to him alone all the glory and honor for again only one is king of every king only one is coming back for me all the praise goes to Jesus all the praise to him Just when I need him, Jesus is near, willing to help me, anxious to cheer. In all my trials, answering prayer, just when I need him most, just when I need him most. Just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most, just when I need him, Jesus is true. 
never forsaking all the way through, giving my birth for burdens, pleasures anew, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. Just when I need him, Jesus is strong, bearing my burdens all the day long, and for my sorrows giving a song just when I need Just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him most. Will you take your hand and I'll turn to 464? I want you to sing this last verse with me in the chorus, please. 464. Just when I need him, he is my all. Answering when upon him I call, tenderly watching me lest I fall. Just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most, sing that chorus again. Just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most. What a Savior. He is near when we need him most. Amen. Appreciate that. All right, let's uh, stand together. We'll shake hands and fellowship one with another. You children that are seven and under, you be making your way to Children's Church at this time. Stand together, shake hands, fellowship one with another. Children under seven, seven and under, make your way to Children's Church.
appreciate that very much. You can be seated this morning. Thank you so much for being with us in the house of the Lord today. Have your Bible today. Turn with us to Ephesians chapter 4, if you will. Ephesians chapter 4. Your Bible. I'm going to read just a couple of verses. We're going to pray together. I'll probably only preach from verse 1 this morning. I will read the first three verses. Several things to say as far as an introduction into this chapter. Then we'll look at a few things. Hopefully the Lord will use to speak to our hearts and be a help to us this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to read the first three verses. Paul, of course, the writer of the book of Ephesians, uh, the inspiration of the Spirit of God, he said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church this morning. Thank you for the Sunday school hour. Thank you for the choir singing, the congregational singing, Brother Brad singing for us. And Lord, we've came to come to the time now, the preaching time. I sure do ask that you would help us. I ask you would use us. I pray you give us clarity of thought and understanding. Help us, Lord, to say things that are pleasing to you, things that bring honor and glory to your name and your word. Help us, Lord, refrain from saying anything in the flesh or anything that would be contrary to what you would have us to say. Use us, Lord, to be a blessing and help to God's people. And Lord, even though the message is not necessarily directed towards those that are lost today. I pray if there is someone under the sound of our voice who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that something, Lord, would be said for them to see the error of their way, the urgency of their need to turn to Christ, the urgency of their need to be saved. And Lord, for all that you do, we'll certainly not fail to recognize and to thank you for doing it, for we realize we can do nothing in and of ourselves. We thank, thank you in, in Jesus, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bible, Bible students know that, that the book of Ephesians, Ephesians is divided into two equal halves. halves. There are six chapters in the book of Ephesians. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, we have uh, the divine life as revealed in the heart of man by the Holy Spirit. In chapters four through six, we have the Christian life as revealed in our conduct or in our daily walk, our daily life. The first, the first three chapters began with, uh, with an act of adoration. If you will turn back there uh, just, just for a moment, chapter 1, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Blessed be God, and it says, Who hath blessed us? And then in those three chapters, those first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, it proceeded to tell us what a wonderful blessing, what, what, what wonderful blessings the Lord has for you and I who are in Christ Jesus. The first, the first three chapters, chapters end in a blaze of glory as well. Look, Look at verse number 20 of chapter 3. The Bible, Bible says, now, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I'm glad God's not able to just do what we desire of him to do. I'm glad God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even think that he can do. He is, he is a great, great God. God. So, so these, these chapters, these last chapters of the book of Ephesians, these three, three chapters, they teach us to prove our devotion to Christ by the actions of our life. In fact, Brother, Brother James said this, this about chapters 4 through 6. I really, I really like this. this. He, he said they, they are as practical as any portion of the Bible outside the book of Proverbs, end of quote. quote. I, I agree with that. that. After, After beginning, beginning chapter 4 with, with the discussion of spiritual gifts that are given to the church, uh, for, for the maturing and perfecting of the body, we'll, leave, we'll, we'll see those things, things when we get down later in the, in the chapter. chapter. The remainder of the book of Ephesians contains instructions for Christian living. In the first, in the first three chapters, we mentioned Paul's focus was on doctrine. doctrine. This, this is the, the in this, this doctrinal teaching, teaching we are taught about our positional standing in Christ, the, the life that we have in Christ, 
And uh, so, so let's do just, just a very quick, quick review of these wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gifts God has bestowed, bestowed upon, upon us who have received the Lord Jesus Christ as our, our personal Savior. Savior. I'm not, not going to mention, mention the, the verse, the chapter, the the verse, the chapter and I'll just say, uh, uh, just mention a thing from that. I'm just talking about our position in Christ, what we have as a gift from Christ because we are in Christ and because we're saved. In chapter 1, verse number 3, we're blessed in, in Christ. In verse number 4, we're chosen in Christ. Verse number 5, we're predestined in Christ. Verse number 7, we have redemption in Christ. Verse number 10, we're all gathered in Him. Verse 11, we have an inheritance in Him. Verse number 19, we have power in Christ. In chapter 2, verse number 5, we're quickened in Christ. Verse number 6, we're raised and seated in heavenly places in Christ. Verse number 7, we have the riches of the grace through Christ. Verse number 10, we're created in Christ. Verse 13, we're made nigh in Christ. Verse 18, we have access to the Father through Christ. Verse 21, we grow in Christ. Verse 22, we're built together in Christ. Then in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 6, we're partakers of the promises in Christ. Verse number 8, we have the riches of Christ. Verse number 11, we have God's purpose in Christ. Verse number 12, we have boldness and access in Him. And then in the last verse, chapter 3, verse 21, glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Now when we get to chapter 4 and we read verse number 1, Paul said, I therefore... And so the word, therefore, is to remind us of all that has been written in these three previous chapters concerning what we are and what we have and our position and the gifts that we have because we are in Christ. I mean, any blessings that we have received because we are in Christ. So, therefore, it is there to remind us or to call our attention to all of those great things and because of that, Paul's shift now in chapter 4 is from doctrine to duty. His shift is from a positional truth where we are in Christ to a practical truth. In other words, he shifts from what we believe to how we behave. I'm, I'm thankful, thankful that, that we, we are in Christ. Christ. I'm, I'm thankful, thankful we have all these great blessings in Christ. I'm thankful for the uh, positional, the doctrinal position that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ of our, because of our salvation. And so Paul is moving from exposition to exhortation. Because you have all of these things, walk worthy of your vocation. And so we'll see that with the help of the Lord. And so having been taught who we are and what we're supposed to believe, Paul now began to teach us how we are to act. Paul knows that uh, we, what, what we have been forgiven from, many have been forgiven, we've been I've forgiven from so many things, and, and thank God that we're forgiven, and so we have been taught about our position, where we are, what we have, and it seems to me that, that duty always arises out of doctrine. We have the doctrine correct, we know all of these great things, and because of that, I therefore beg you to walk worthy of your vocation. We, we have the doctrinal, but, but do, do we have the walk? Do we have the duty in Christ Jesus? Jesus? I'll say this, our practice will always be dictated by the precepts that we believe to be true. Oftentimes we say that we believe things to be true, and yet we don't often, our lives do not often prove that those things are true. In other, In other words, if we're going to behave right, we must believe right. Because bad doctrine has never led anyone to live right. And we have correct doctrine. We have right doctrine. We have true doctrine. We have correct Bible doctrine. Our life should prove the truth of that doctrinal position that we have in Christ. He wants us to know, the Apostle Paul, obviously, through the Spirit of God, I want you to understand that, writing through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he he wants us to know that who we are should have an impact on what we are. In other words, Brother Jordan made mention of his Sunday school this morning. Does, 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 does people know that you are a believer in Christ Jesus? I, I am all for it. I thought about this when he made that statement because I knew what was coming up in my message. I thought, I thought about this. I, I, I like all the paraphernalia. I, I, I like wearing shirts that say Jesus saves. I like wearing shirts. 
that, that have Bible messages, messages on them. I like to have them on my bumper, bumper stickers, stickers on my car, this, that, and the other. All, All those, those things are great. great. I think you ought to continue to do that. I think if you don't do that, you ought to, you ought to get some and do that. But without those things, without that advertisement on the outside, does anybody know by your life that, that you're, you're a Christian, Christian and, and that, that you, you love, love Jesus? Jesus. That's, That's a good, good question. question. And so, and so that, that's, that's what Paul is talking about, about or going, going to begin talking about in these, these chapters, these practical chapters, chapters in, in chapter 4, four through, through 6. six. He wants, he wants us to know that what we believe about God should determine how we behave before men. men. And so, and so he, he says here, here look at verse again, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord... Beseech you that you will worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now, now we're going to sort of look, look at this one verse, and we're, we're going to look at it, I guess, from, from, from the end of the verse backwards, backwards pretty much. much. So, so first, first of all, look at this little phrase at the end, ye are called. So we'll look at three things about this calling, and in that we'll talk about some other things in the verse. So he said, first of all, the calling is persuasive. We're being persuaded to walk a certain way. Paul said, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. Now, if you remember chapter 3 and verse 1, Paul said for this cause, or the Bible says for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. So Paul is reminding us again that he is a prisoner in Rome while he is writing this letter to the church of Ephesus. Paul wants him to know that while he may be locked up physically, physically he is in a jail in prison, that prison cell, those Roman jailers, whoever they may be, whatever the case may be, they have not limited his ability spiritually to write and to communicate the Lord Jesus Christ through the pen and what a blessing that that is. And so he's locked up, but really he is in the custody of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like this. When Paul became a Christian, he became the property of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and I did as well. You don't have to turn there. For the sake of time, I'll read this. Romans 8, verse number 12. Paul said, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. And so because of our position in Christ Jesus, we're no longer a debtor to the flesh. We shouldn't be living after the flesh any longer. We should be living our lives for the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And, and so, so the, the prisoners, prisoners there in Rome, they, they may have very well had the key to Paul's cell, but, but I tell you this, they weren't in control of Paul's actions because he was living his life, even in physical captivity, he was living his life in such a way to bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, regardless of our circumstances, we ought to be striving to live our life to bring honor and glory to the Lord. Paul is reminding them prisoners, them the, the, the church, church of Ephesus, Ephesus and you and I as well, we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute, he's, he's reminding them of this fact. I may be in prison, or in fact, I am in prison, and if I can live for the Lord here, if I can let my light shine here, if I can be an example here, if I can be a witness for Christ here, why can't you out there? It's it's a, a, the, the calling is persuasive. Call, Paul is, is persuading them. them. He, he wants them to consider the choice of of the challenge, or the source, I should say, of the challenge. He, listen, he said, look, in other words, Paul said, I'm not asking you to do anything that I am not doing myself. I'm not being hypocritical. I'm not asking you to live in any way that I'm not living myself. I want you to consider your calling. So Paul, so Paul said, look, I am a prisoner. Look, look at me. What, what I have believed is determining how I act and what I do for the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is calling them to live a life that he is already living. Now listen, we, we have excuses. We all have excuses. Uh, we, we all know people that we can point a finger at. All people, we, we all know people that we can accuse. All people that we can use as an excuse for not doing this or for not doing that or for behaving uh, in a bad way or a bad manner. We, we can do all of those things. All of us, we, I, I'm not saying you have, I, but I'm saying the majority of people, that they have someone they can point to to use as an excuse. I, I did that for many, many years when I was away from God. I found an individual who I could blame and I did that that for a number of years. years. I, you know what? This, this, this is not in the message, message, not part of the message, but I'm here to say this. I, I used it as an excuse 
from the, the time, time I was 18, 18 to almost 30 years old to live the way I wanted to live, live and, and I did, did that by pointing my finger at someone else. else. You know, you know when I got help? help? When, when I realized they, they weren't the problem, problem I was. And when, and when I, I came to that realization, I got some help. So you, you, you can blame, blame anybody you want to. You can point at anybody you want to. But let me tell you the Lord's at. Lord, Lord, so you can blame anybody you want to. But the example I give you is this, this man that's in prison, and, and he is living his life to the fullest for the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so whoever it is that you're looking to as an excuse, the Lord said don't look for that example. I gave you an example. He's the Apostle Paul. He is in prison for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at him. That's the example. How about, How about that? that? That'll help you. That's, That's persuasive. persuasive. The, the calling, calling is persuasive. persuasive. Now, now look, look, at, look at chapter 4, verse 1 again. The calling is personal. Paul, Paul said, I therefore the, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. you. So Paul, Paul is saying, through the Holy Spirit, I, am, I beseech you. you. He's, He's speaking, speaking to the individual. He's speaking to you. you. Now, now, we, we know, know that this book was written to the Church of Ephesus some, some 2,000 years ago or so, but, but it could just, just as well be hand-delivered hand to each of us today. today and, and, and so, so from, from here to the end of this epistle, we, we need to understand that, that the instruction that is given in this, this epistle is for each of us who have trusted Christ as our personal Savior. They're written to challenge us to reach our fullest potential for the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. The, the word, word beseech, beseech he, he said here, I beseech you, or, 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 or I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you. The word beseech is in the Bible 64 times, beseeching three times, and besought 44 times. So 111 times in the Bible we have the, uh, the word or the derivative of the word beseech, and it means to beg. It, it means, means to make an urgent appeal. appeal. It, it means, means to entreat. And, and so, so I keep making mention of the fact of what the Bible says here that Paul is in prison. And, and so, so Paul says, look, I'm in prison. I can't be with you. And so I am beseeching you or I am begging you. And, and so, so thank God that as believers we have the Holy Spirit of God who has taken up residence in our heart. He lives in us. He comforts us. He guides us. He teaches us. He helps us, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is a great blessing. And I'll tell you something else we have. We have a body of believers. That was the first three chapters. We're no longer Jew. We're no longer Gentile. We are one in Christ Jesus. We're the body of Christ. We're the church of the living God. And so we have each other and, and we have an obligation to each other to come along and to help and to encourage and exhort. And so Paul says, I can't be with you. I'm over here, but I want to encourage you to live in such a way that's pleasing to God. And so what a blessing it is we have an entire body. We ought to be encouraging one another to live for the Lord. In fact, I want to give you, I want to give you three things here about this soul. Uh, quickly uh, about a friend. I, I believe Paul. Uh, Paul is obviously an apostle. Paul has obviously uh, had a lot of influence with the church of Ephesus and all of those things. And he's writing this epistle. But Paul is also a friend of these believers. And so a true friend will do a couple of things, three things. He'll reach out in love, first of all, to encourage. Come to Acts chapter 11. I don't, I don't know, know where time goes to on Sunday morning, but it doesn't go to the preacher. Amen. Time, time is your friend, not mine. So th three things about this. A true friend will reach out in love. Number one, to encourage. Look at Acts chapter 11. Look at verse 22. Then the tidings of these things came to the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of, uh, full of the Holy Ghost and of faith and much people was added unto the Lord. Now, now, in Acts, Acts chapter 11, 11, I'll give you just a brief uh, overview of what's going on in the chapter. Peter is rehearsing the, the events of Acts chapter 10 where Cornelius and the Gentiles 
vows. We're, we're saved by grace through, through faith. They receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, you know, all those things that happen there. And, and so Barnabas is sent to this church, or sent from the church, I should say, in Jerusalem, to the church at Antioch, and he exhorted them all. Now, the word exhorted means to beg. It means to beseech. It means to console. It means to encourage. And so he is encouraging, he is sent there, and he is encouraging these people to trust the Lord for salvation. And the Bible says, and much people were added to the Lord. Now, I want you to notice the end result of this encouragement. Look at verse 25. You're still in Acts chapter 11. Then, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. Saul. And, and when, when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And, and it, it came, came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And so, and so he goes there, Barnabas, Barnabas does, to an encouragement. True, true friend will, will encourage you, first of all, to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you, if you truly love someone, you're you truly a friend, friend of someone, maybe, maybe you work, work with them, maybe you go to school, school with them, maybe they're acquaintance, a, a true friend will encourage them to know Jesus as their, their personal Savior. Savior. The Bible, Bible said he went, went there, he done, done that, much people were added, added to the Lord after a year's time, time they were called Christians first at Antioch. What a blessing. Now, now come to Acts, Acts chapter 18. 18. Second, Second thing that a friend will do, a true friend will do, first of all, he will encourage you to know Christ. He will really encourage, encourage you to live, live for God. God. So, so if anyone's, anyone's ever been a witness, witness to you, if anyone, anyone ever took, took, time to, took, to, to, took time to tell, to tell you about Jesus Christ, they, they are a true friend. friend. That was that a good, good place, place for an amen. amen. To, to instruct, instruct, to instruct. Look, look at 18, 18, Acts chapter 18, 18 verse 24. True friend, uh, true friend, friend will instruct. Look, look at chapter 18, 18 verse 24. And, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This, this man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being forever in the spirit, he spake and told diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he, and he began, began to speak boldly in the synagogue, of whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they, they took him unto them and expounded, or explained, unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now listen, listen a true, true friend, friend, a friend who, who loves you, is not a friend who, because you have something incorrect in your life, is going to run from you or forsake you or turn your back, turn their back on you. Aquila and Priscilla, this man came, he was an eloquent speaker, but he knew only the baptism of John. And so instead of excommunicating him, instead of getting rid of him, instead of uh, kicking him out, breaking fellowship, not having anything else to do with him, they took him unto themselves and they expounded or explained unto him the word of God more perfectly. They took time to instruct him. Now, I understand that first of all, you have to be willing to be instructed. We're living in a time when there's not many people who are willing to receive instruction. But Apollos, in, in spite of the fact that he was an eloquent speaker and an eloquent man, he allowed Aquila and per, not, uh, he allowed them to tell him or to teach him more plainly the things of the Lord. What a blessing that that is that he would allow him, that he would take time to be instructed and he would take time to listen. He was teachable. Are you teachable? Are you, are you willing to instruct someone who may not have the understanding that you have or do you say, well, they don't believe like I do, so I don't... Okay. Okay. Quiet this morning. Am I off? Did I have the wrong message? Am I preaching the wrong thing? Have I got a different Bible? Just plowing. How about that? Yeah, so to encourage, to instruct, or to, here's the third thing, true friend will challenge you. Look at, look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I like what David F. said. I just thought about that. I said that. He said, uh, well, but this is the wrong message, I preach the wrong thing, but then I'm in too far to stop now, so we're just going to keep going. Amen. Brother Epps, Galatians chapter 2, true friend will challenge you. Would you allow people to challenge you, or do you sub up and puff up and run off? Galatians chapter 2, look what he says in verse 11. 
But when Peter was coming to Antioch, I would stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So this is Paul, and he is challenging Peter. He is rebuking Peter. And by the way, Peter later commended the Apostle Paul, just in case you're wondering. In verse number 12, the Bible says, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of circumcision. And the, and the other Jews dis dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas was carried away with their dissimulation. That word means hypocrisy. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? And so, and so just, just to paraphrase, paraphrase quickly, quickly what has happened here and talk about, about the fact that Paul is challenging Peter. Peter behaved one way in front of the Gentiles and he behaved another way in front of the Jews. And so, and so I, just, just, to, just to say it plainly, if you will, uh, he was acting hypocritically. And, and so Paul challenged him and rebuked him for his hypocrisy. Listen, can, can you take, take it if somebody challenges you? you? If somebody, if somebody said, look, look this, this, this is not right, right. This, this is what Peter, Peter this is what Paul did. Now, this is not just, just any guy, this is Peter. And Paul, Paul said, look, Peter, you, you behave this way in front of the Gentiles Gentile because you fear the Jews, those, those of the circumcision. And, and so when those of the circumcision come, you join to them and you oppose the Gentiles. You can't, you can't behave, behave like that. that. That's, That's not Christian behavior. behavior. That's, That's not godly behavior. And so he challenged him. Can you take it when people challenge you? Let me, Let me say, say this, lest you be confused. confused. A, A true, true friend, friend is the one who would challenge you. This is what, what we're talking about. about. The, the true, true friend is the one who... Now, here's, here's what, what happens. happens. I, I've, I've been, been pastor for a long time. time. You know you what know, happens 99% you know of the time? time? Christianity, Christianity in America, America is so fickle. You puff up, up you blow up, up you have an audience to your brother, you never speak, speak to them again, you never have fellowship with them again, you never, never want anything to do with them again, again simply because they were trying to help you. You know, you know why? You're, you're full, full of self-righteous self indignation. indignation. You're, you're welcome. welcome. Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, here's, here's the fourth thing, thing a true, true friend will restore you. you. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse number 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, now, many, many of us, if not all of us, have been overtaken in a fall. I won't, I won't ask you for a show, show of hands, but if, if I were, I would expect almost every hand, if not every hand in the building, to go up. Do you have any faults? <laughs> That's what I figured. All right, so if, if any man be overtaken in a fall, listen, if you are a true friend, according to this passage of Scripture, if you are a spiritual Christian, you will restore the one that's overtaken in a fault. Do I need to say that again? According to this passage of Scripture, if you are a spiritual, you which are spiritual, if you are a spiritual, you said, you said that three or four times, I will say it again. A lot of people think they're spiritual. A lot of people think they're spiritual because they avoid everyone. A lot of people think they're spiritual because they don't interact with anyone. A lot of people think they're spiritual because they're hermits. Spiritual believers restore other brethren who have fallen into a fault. That's spiritual Christianity. Not a lot of shouting this morning. Listen, if, if you are a true friend, if you're a spiritual Christian, you will restore the one overtaking the fault. Now, we're going on this passage of Scripture. You will do this in a spirit of meekness. The Bible, I'm, I'm still, still these, these, these first two verses, verses six, uh, Galatians chapter 6, six verse 1 and 2. You won't do it with arrogance. You won't do it with pride. You won't try to restore them thinking that you're better than them. You restore them in a spirit of meekness considering yourself. I'm going to tell you, you better get off of that high horse. 
because the day for you to get knocked off of the horse is coming. If it has not already come, it will come. And if it has already come, it may come again. And so before you get all high and mighty and I got it all figured out and I got all the answers and everybody better look to me, I'm up here. You, you are a proud and the Holy Spirit goes before a fall. And so in the spirit of meekness, you restore that one who has a fault. That shows Christian maturity on your behalf. That shows spirituality on your behalf. And you do that in meekness because you're considering yourself. You know what that means? I'm afraid I may very well fall prey to the same thing. So I'm considering myself. Now, if you refuse to, destroy the, to restore brethren who have been taken over to fall, several things. Listen, I... I, I know it's 5, five after 12, and, and no, I'm nowhere near finished. So I'll have to quit somewhere. I'll tell, tell you this. If you refuse to restore the brethren who have been overtaken to fall, there's a few things you are not. Number one, you are not a true friend. Number two, you are not spiritual. Number three, you are not meek. And number four, you do not consider yourselves lest you also... Have, have a fall or be overtaken, overtaken in a fall. fall. All, All of those things are just from those two verses. verses. And so, so what does a true friend, friend do? He restores. Well, here, here's, here's the last thing. thing. I didn't realize I had so many. many. Look, Look at come to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 22. Here's a, what, what number are we on? Five. Here, here's, here's a number five. A true, true friend will help. help. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 22. 22. We'll look at one in the Old Testament, one in the New, First John chapter 3 in just a moment. But Deuteronomy 22. Verse number four, true friend will help. Deuteronomy 22, four. The Bible says, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way and hide thyself from him. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. Now, I want to say a couple of things. Physically, Physically, there, there may be no way that you can help your brother out of the ditch. I, I, I say that, I was thinking about this early this morning. There, there has been, been, and there, there are even right, right now, I, I, I can't elaborate, elaborate. I, I can tell you numerous situations that I know about and I'm praying about, about, and physically I cannot do anything at all about, about that situation. situation. So how, so how do you, do you help, help them? them? You, you pray, pray for them. them. And so, so there, there, there are, there's, there's many people, there are oxes in the ditch, so to speak, and there's, there's nothing that I can do physically to get that ox out of the ditch. But I'll, I'll promise, promise you this. this. You, you, we, 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 you may not be able to physically help them. There, you may not have any means whatsoever to support them. But spiritually, here's what I have been. Here's what I continue to try to be. I try, I try to, to be a shoulder for them to cry on. on. I, I just, just this, this, this week, week more, 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 than, more than more than one preacher contacted me. This situation, this situation that's just, there's, there's nothing I can do about those situations. situations. Physically, there's, there's nothing I can do about those situations. Financially, there's, there's nothing I can do about those situations. I'll tell you this: I can, I can be there to listen to their cry, to listen to their heartbreak, and I can pray for them that God would help them, that God would be in their situation. I want to help, man. This is, we, we can, can and we can and we should help bear one another's burdens. Now, now look at First John, First John chapter three, verse eighteen. We're talking about we should be there to help. First John chapter three, verse eighteen. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Listen, don't, don't, don't just say that you'll pray for their situation. Pray for their situation. Don't just say that you'll be there for them, and then if they need you or ask you to be there for them, you're not. Amen. So a true friend will help. A true friend, come back to our text, chapter 4, verse 1, Ephesians. A true friend is someone like Paul 
A true friend is someone who refuses to allow you to live a substandard life. A true friend is someone who helps you become more like Jesus. They come along to encourage you. They come along to instruct you. They come along to challenge you, to, to uh, restore you, and to help you. So the calling is persuasive. The calling is personal. Third of all, this, this is the last thing. The calling is practical. Look at the verse again. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. Now notice this phrase. That you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now listen, this, this is very, very important, okay? You're not waiting to be called. You're not going to be called. You're already called. So stop waiting on the call and answer the call. It's like Ed McMahon's calling. You've won, you've won $10 million in the whatever that thing is. I can't remember anymore. It's been, they don't call anymore. And so, you know, the phone's ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing. He's calling, but you don't answer, so you don't get the prize. You've been called. He's calling. He's calling. He's calling. He's calling. You've already been called. Answer the call. What call? He, he wants you to walk worthy. The call is to walk worthy of the vocation where he's been called. So walk here means more than just moving about. It means uh, all of our inward and outward motions, all of our thoughts and words and actions. It, it takes in not only everything that we do, but everything that we either speak or think. It speaks of our conduct and how we live our lives day by day. So listen, the word walk is going to be used continually throughout the remainder of of the, the book of Ephesians. So it says to walk worthy. Worthy, worthy means suitable, deserving, having an adequate merit. merit. It, it talks, talks about our vocation. vocation. That means it's, it's a calling, it's an invitation. invitation. We've been called to salvation by Jesus Christ. We, we should strive to walk worthy of that calling. It's, it's a vocation, it's a lifelong calling. It's, it's not one, one day a week or a few days, days a week or a few days, days a year or, or some special days here or special days there. there. No, it's, it's a vocation. vocation. It's, it's a lifelong. You ought to be a Christian every day. You ought to live in such a way that's pleasing the Lord every day. Now, I'll just give you this. I won't take time to preach it. There's, there's several things here. Uh, we're called to be different. Second Corinthians chapter 5, any man being Christ is a new creature. We're called to be holy. First Peter chapter 1. Verse number, number start verse 13, 13, go down to verse number 16, where, where the Bible says, calls it, it's written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Uh, first, first John, John chapter 2, we're called to be like Jesus Christ. Christ. And, so and so may the Lord help you and I to walk, and I to walk worthy of the vocation that we have been called. Our Lord has constantly been put to open shame by those who claim to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, and then they live their lives in complete and utter Opposites of what the Bible teaches that you should live. That's horrible. It ought, it ought, it ought not be so. Amen. And so God helps you. You know the Lord is your Savior. You, uh, you've been born again. May the Lord help us to walk worthy of that vocation where we've been called. Jesus Christ is our personal Savior. We should live our lives in such a way that brings honor, that brings honor and glory to His name. Now listen. If you are saved and you're not living that way, why don't you start doing that today? What are you waiting on? Start living that way today. All right, listen, Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the challenge. Thank you for the Apostle Paul and in his faithfulness and obedience to the Spirit of the Lord. Be willing to be an example to all of us throughout thousands of years now and years to come of a one who, in spite of his circumstances, was willing to live for God and serve the Lord. May we be that kind of person, that kind of individual. And Lord, we thank you for that. Love you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we close this, this